Hi there, it's Marla at Narrate. In this week's message, Adam explores the compassionate and gracious aspect of God's character. Is God a God who likes you and is for you? Enjoy the second message in the God Has a Name series. So if you're guests this, welcome. We're thrilled that you're here. Uh, you're catching us on kind of a, a fun weekend, a weird weekend. So let me just put out a disclaimer that this weekend will be a little bit different than anything we've done in recent history. So if you're horrified, then I just say, try another church next week. <laughs> or, or, or even perhaps this one. We started a series uh, last week called God Has a Name. And we started with, I think, a very important confession. And quite frankly, I think if one of the things that comes out of this series for us is a greater awareness of the importance of this confession, I think we'll all be the better for it. I don't mean that in a patronizing way. I just mean that in a, like, as, as well-intentioned people who are chasing after the heart of God, there, there's some things that can get out of balance. And we started last week by, by, by just acknowledging that, that to make claims about God, about his character, about his nature, about his will, about his priorities, about the way God functions and the thing he, things he cares about, it's a really, really dangerous thing. That's not to say it's not worthwhile. In fact, it's kind of ironic that we're even saying that because we are a church. I have a Bible in my hand. We're kind of organized around this idea of, of knowing God and following God. And yet I do want to argue that it's important that we start with this confession because in the pursuit of knowing God, things can get out of balance very quickly. We, in, the, in, in our desires to explain God, can end up with a God who's much smaller than God really is. Because in this desire to, to put categories and explanations and, and to somehow foresee the way he behaves, what, what can happen is we lose sight of the fact that God is still completely other. That God at his core is, is still a mystery to us. That in places like the Bible, he reveals parts of his person to us. But that shouldn't be confused for him revealing all parts of the person of God to us. And there's a tension there. We talked about this God who wants to be known accurately and personally and the, and the dangers that come with that. In fact, last week, uh, many of you, uh, 171 of you to be exact, uh, left with one of these little rubber ninjas. And if you missed out on that great opportunity, there's still some more up here. Uh, we, we grabbed a few more. But, but the idea here was, was to take uh, this with you and, and carry it in your pocket through the rest of the series, which we're going to end this series on Thanksgiving. So you could maybe even use them as part of the decoration on your Thanksgiving dinner. Just put it out there and see what kind of conversation you have. But the idea here was this, this perpetual reminder uh, that, the, that the art of theology is, is both a worthwhile art and a dangerous one. That in the desire to explain God, we can trivialize God. And trivializing this technical term would really mean shrinking God down to this size that we can manage, that we can control, that we can predict. And if we're not careful, our attempts of doing theology are less about knowing God and more about controlling God. And it's this thing that happens throughout the scriptures that God warns us about over and over and over again. So the idea was that you could carry your little rubber ninja idol thing around with you. But the other thing we did last week is we, we went, but wait a minute. What if we all are technically theologians? Now, none of us would call ourselves that. I certainly wouldn't. That's, that's a very big term. I don't call myself doctor because I'm not. I don't call myself theologian because I'm not. Like that, That's a big term. But what if we all are technically theologians? I mean, what if everyone from the ISIS militant to the fundamentalist Christ follower to the progressive Christ follower to you and I to, to the Hindu to the African witch doctor to, to, to the most... A secular atheist? What if we are all technically theologians? And the importance there is, if we're being honest, we're all living out what we believe about God. We all have views on God, even if those views are that God, this God doesn't exist. And therefore, those views drive the way we live as much as, if not more than most things. And, there, and what we said last week then was, if on the one hand we could admit that theology is dangerous, would it also do us well to admit that, that it's just as dangerous to say, I, I, don't, I don't have any claims on God. I don't believe anything about God. Would it be just as dangerous to not check our views of God, to not refine our theology, to, to not grow in the way we're understanding both the scriptures and God in general? Many of you are part of career paths that require continuing ed credits. What happens to the well-intentioned Christ follower who's still believing the same things 40 years later? Is it just as dangerous to not continually grow in our thinking and thoughts about, about this God? You know, theology, we said last week, is this big word. 
And go ahead, next slide. It's really made up of two Greek words. The first one meaning theo, which, or the first one is theo, which means God. The second one is logos or logos. Uh, depends on what seminary you go to. Uh, that equals, that means word, which means theology is really a word about God, which is what gets us to this question. Uh, are there really any of us who, who, who aren't living out some word about God? So having done all that, what we did is we opened Exodus 34, which is in some parts ironic, but that's part of what we're doing. We are a community organized around the Judeo-Christian tradition and recognizing the scriptures as this incredible gift from God. And so in Exodus 34, Moses, this great leader of Israel who led them out of Egypt, he had, and we're going to get back at this a little bit this morning, he at one point says to God, okay, God, show me your glory. It was in the song we just sung which was really an ancient Mesopotamian way of saying, uh, tell me what you're like. What is your name? And God said to Moses in Exodus 34, the Lord, the Lord, or Yahweh, Yahweh. We talked about this. uh, The Lord is a a translation of Yahweh because people didn't want, they wanted to respect God by not saying the name. So anytime you see lowercase capital Lord, it's referring to Yahweh. The Lord, the Lord, or Yahweh, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. In fact, part of what we said last week, I don't play this card, I don't think I've ever played it before, but part of what I just kind of suggested, asked, was if you would just commit to being a part of this series for every week of the series. Because the real danger here is if we pick and choose the parts of God that we want to pay attention to and ignore the uncomfortable parts, because there's some uncomfortable parts in there, that, that will lead to its own type of toxicity. So what we're going to do is try to move slowly through what is this God saying about himself, which is even, there you go, there's the pronoun, which is so difficult uh, to avoid. What, what, what is this God telling us about the, the nature of, of the way he functions, the way he moves, the way he interacts? So here's what I want to do this morning. We're going to key in on the compassionate and gracious piece, but here's where it gets a little weird. What I want to, I think that, that one of the parts of, let me just do, start with an I think statement, then we'll dive into it. I think part of what makes understanding what scripture is saying about God so difficult to appreciate is that we have, uh, it's hard to recognize what the general view of the gods were some 15 or 3,500 years ago that we take for granted today uh, uh, that God is loving and kind and for us and cares about us, no matter what your kind of religious tradition in general, especially in in North America, we, we just, no matter how Christian we are or aren't, we think that God is kind and nice and benevolent and cares for people. That is not an assumption that people could have made in 1500 BC. That would have been a radical concept 3,500 years ago. So here's what I've, part of what I want to ask you to do, is, is I want you to imagine yourselves, I want us to imagine ourselves that it's 1500 BC or BCE, I don't want to get hung up on that, and you are wandering somewhere around the, the Mount Sinai. You're somewhere in the desert, there, there's a snapshot of, of it. Now we think of desert and we think these long flat plains of sand dunes. The Middle Eastern desert is, is mountainous much like ours much like this, but it's dry, it's barren. What I want you to do is imagine that you are wandering that region because I think that can help us get inside this mindset. And here's what I want to do in part this morning is, is to help you do that, I'm going to give you some unleavened bread because I thought, well, let's just, and some of you are like, I don't even eat bread. That's okay, take it anyway. I just want you to, so I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to pass out some bread. I think that, no, that's the wrong one. And this is going to take a second. And I, I do have the flu, but... I didn't handle any of these last week, so so you're just going to take one and, and pass it down, okay? Because clearly the Hebrew people ate tortilla shells 3,500 years ago. And even if you're like, I don't eat gluten, that's okay, just take one, will you, and, and feel it and be weird about it, and I told you it was going to be weird, okay. Ready? Oh, here, I'm, gonna just, I'm just going to throw them at you. Ready? Hey. Okay. It's the epitome of empty calories right there. Okay, how are we doing? All the high school kids are excited because that's like your favorite meal, right? Right, right there. 
if only there was some cheese in a microwave. <clears throat> so, 1500 BC, you're wandering around this desert. All you've had to eat for some time now is unleavened bread. Now, it's not quite like this, but I have had bread with the Bedouins in this part of the world. And it's a lot like this, uh, though obviously not exactly like this. Remember, this is a world that, that is pregnant with gods. This is a world where every natural, every physical experience is explained through the gods. And gods is plural because there's lots of them. Different cultures have them. Different parts of the world have them. Different phenomenons have them. And remember, these are gods who are predominantly angry. These are gods, and this is not just a Christian idea. This is a historical fact. These are gods who saw humans as their pawns. These gods did not like people. They were angry at people. They were malicious. They were cruel. And your job as a person was to try to stay out of their way, maybe kind of like growing up in an abusive home, if you know what I mean. Your job was, was, to, was to get out of the way. From this whole religious experience comes a system of sacrifice. In some part to keep the gods on your team, more like to keep the gods from crushing you. And so you would sacrifice things, sometimes food, sometimes it's something as simple as a bird, sometimes something a little more like a goat. In many cultures, it would involve a firstborn son. In one account, I could point you to the book if you'd like to read it. I couldn't get all the way through it because it was so horrific. But the god Marduk, his priest, this is an ancient Mesopotamian culture, his priest would show up at the birth of the firstborn son and would mark that son for sacrifice. Now, if, as if that's not bad enough, he would mark the son for sacrifice, but the son wasn't taken immediately. It was like he would bear, bear this mark. I, I can't remember if there's a bracelet or what it was, but everybody would know this son belongs to Marduk. At some point, this son's throat will be slit and he will be thrown into a fire for the gods. It might be on day six. It might be on his seventh month birthday. It might be on his first birthday. It might be when he's nine years old. This, this priest can show up and say, today's the day, and take that person now, that kid now. This is the world that you live in. In fact, may, maybe remembering the, the, the story, the epic battle of Troy in the Trojan War can be helpful. Is it history? Is it myth? There's all kinds of conversation there. Remember, part of what that story entails is the Greek king was making his way across a part of the Mediterranean Sea to go fight in the Trojan War. En route, in his ships, with his fleet, he becomes dead in the water, which means his car won't start. It means there's no more wind. And literally, the, the, in, in this story, their ships are just, it's just placid. There's no movement. There's no wind. There's no understanding of how are we going to move on from here. To paddle would be impractical. Obviously, gasoline would do them no good. And they start to ask, what, what do we do? How do we get the show on the road again? And the logical thing to do is turn to Artemis. Artemis was this major Greek goddess who was incredibly angry all the time. And naturally, they come to the conclusion that what Artemis wants is a sacrifice. And so the king of Greece, led in council by some religious folks, comes to the conclusion that what he has to do is sacrifice his daughter. And so he does. He slits her throat and offers her to Artemis and Instantly, the wind starts to blow again, and they're en route for the battle. Now, what is this? Is this myth, or is this history? Is this the superstitious explanation of random weather patterns? Or is this the behavior of the gods who mostly don't like people and see them as their pawns? This is the world, as you wander the desert, this is the world that you know. And what's happening to you of late is you are being introduced to a God who is completely different than anything else you had ever heard of. This God showed up while you were a slave in Egypt, and you had been for hundreds of years. Hard to get our brains around. The, the Jews were, were slaves in Egypt for longer than the United States has existed. It's the only thing you knew. You may have had some cursory understanding of a Hebrew God who was supposedly different, but what you knew was being a slave in a land pregnant with gods where you weren't even human. Suddenly this God shows up. He leads you out. You're free. You're in the desert. You're like, sweet, we're going to Hawaii. And then you get to the airport and it's like, sorry, your flight is canceled. Because as you're making your way through the desert, you come upon the Red Sea. You're trapped. You hear that Pharaoh has changed his mind. He's coming for you. And you have that incredibly anticlimactic moment. And then some miraculous things happen around the Red Sea. 
You end up on the other side. Pharaoh ends up dying or at least is thwarted in his cause. You're on the other side of the Red Sea. Now you're in this very desert. And then you realize, wait a minute, what are we going to eat? And someone goes, I know, we'll go to Costco and buy a bunch of tortilla shells. That's what we'll eat. <laughs> and God goes, no, to tell, you, tell you what I'll do. Every morning when you wake up, there'll be tortilla shells everywhere. And someone goes, like, wait, wait a minute, what are, what are we going to drink? And Moses takes a stick and throws it in this murky water and it becomes drinkable. And one time he gets angry. It actually costs him his life. He gets angry and hits a rock and water comes out of the ground. And so, suddenly, suddenly your needs are met by this God and you haven't made a sacrifice yet. You've done nothing for this God just yet. And there's this, there's this growing sense of like, who is this God? And one day Moses comes down from Sinai. He says, check this out, you guys. I asked him his name, and he said, it's Yahweh. And they're like, driverless cars? I can't even get my brain around that. Who, who, Yahweh? Like, they knew a world with lots and lots of gods. This was a brand new category, Yahweh. What does Yahweh mean? And Moses says, well, he told us his name, and it starts that he is the compassionate and gracious God. Do you see how different this God is from anything else you knew? Maybe this has been your experience in recent uh, life, in your own experience of Jesus. Like, wait a minute. He is completely different than the one I've rejected. This is their experience. Now, in the Hebrew culture, order matters. It matters in every culture. Uh, what's the First Amendment? Anybody? First Amendment? Free, yeah, freedom of speech. Okay, what's the 17th Amendment? You know this one? I had to Google it. It has something to do with two senators for every state and six-year terms. See, order's important, right? That God says, first, I'm compassionate and gracious, is a big deal. One theologian says that what we're learning from, from Moses is that God's primary emotion towards you is compassion and grace. Now, in, in the Hebrew, compassion and grace, go to that next slide, it looks like this. Uh, Rahum we hanun. I have no idea if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I only plagiarize people who take uh, original language classes, but let's just do that together. Will you say that with me? Rahum we hanun. Rahum we hanun. Rahum is that word compassion. I just want to break this down for a second. Rahum is the word that's often translated compassion. Rahum is a feeling word. Rahum, in fact, th this, this will kind of weird some of you out, but I think this is actually incredible into the inside of how different this God is. Rahum comes from the root word that means female womb. That's where this word compassion comes from. Rahum is the way a woman, a mother, feels about her infant child. And you go, wait a minute. God's a woman? He has a, she has a womb? And this God feels... Yes, this is part of what's going on in the text, is this God is likening himself. Pronouns are so infuriating when you start catch yourself using them. This is a God who's going, I, my primary emotion towards you is best likened to the way a mother feels about a child. In fact, there's a story, a story in First, Song, in first Kings about two prostitute moms, or two prostitute women who, who give birth to boys. And in the middle of the night, they, they both live under the same roof. In the middle of the night, uh, one, one of the women inadvertently falls asleep while feeding her son and suffocates him to death. She wakes up. She's horrified. She realizes what's happened. She looks across the room, and she sees this other mom with a baby alive and well. And she does the unthinkable. This is before the age of security and bracelets. She sneaks over, and she exchanges the babies. Next morning, the, the mom whose baby is actually alive is, is greeted by a, a dead child. And, and again, she's, she's filled with grief. She's horrified. She's also a mom, and it doesn't take her long to go, wait a minute, this isn't my son. She, she hires some, some, some reporters. They learn, like, wait a minute, your son's on the other side of the room. She figures it out, but they can't reconcile the difference. They go before the king, and they tell the king their story, and they're relying upon the king to give them their answer. Do you remember this story? This is kind of a wild story. The king says, okay, here's what we're going to do. Here's how we solve the riddle. Cut the baby in half. Each of you gets half of the baby. And one of the mothers, verse 26 in, in 1 Kings 3, the woman whose son was alive was deeply moved out of love for her son and said to the king, please, my lord, give her the living baby. Don't kill him. That, that phrase, deeply moved out of love, it's our word, rahum. The... the, the, the 
Here's what Rahum is telling the Hebrew people in the desert. You, 1,500 years ago, while you chew on your tortilla shell, God likes you. The primary thing he feels towards you is he likes you. Now, we is the word and. Hanun then becomes this word graciousness. If, if Rahum is how a parent feels, Hanun is an action word. Go ahead that next slide. Hanun has something, it means something you do to help somebody in need. It's, it's, it's the fatherly and motherly part who will do anything to, to, for their kids. It's the part of you that will get up at two and go help the right people get out of the ditch. In fact, in, in the text, this, this word gracious, one place where it shows up is in Psalm 86, and it actually shows up a whole bunch, but I had lots of time constraints this week as I was trying to figure out what, what research to use and which not. Watch Psalm 86. But you, O Lord, are, compassion, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. We said last week, this is the most quoted text from the Bible in the Bible. There's an instance of it. Watch verse 16. Turn to me and have mercy on me. Show your strength in behalf of your servant. Save me because I serve you just as my mother did. That word, uh, mercy, is our word graciousness. This God, Moses says, this God, doesn't, th- th- this God doesn't dislike us. He doesn't hate us. This God likes us, and he's for us. Let me ask you this, because part of the danger of this is not all of us grew up in homes, and this is the, the horror of our times, right, where, where our parents put the divine on display for us. Let, let, let's, let me ask the question this way. Who were the first healthy adults? Who was the first healthy adult in your life? who you felt genuinely liked by, right? Like a coach and maybe a teacher in middle school, someone in high school, maybe your first boss. Did you, can, can, can you put a face to the first adult other than your parents? Because that's crucial too. But I think I'm going to argue we, we need people other than our parents to, to, to tell us we're likable as well. Who was the first adult other than your parents that made you feel liked? And how much did you lean into who they were and what they were about? You know, just to brag for a second on our, on our student leaders right now, high school and middle school, a few weeks ago, uh, we had this new slot in the volunteer role where we're asking parents, and you don't have to be a parent, to about once a quarter come volunteer on a Wednesday night from about 6.45 to 8.30 or so, and just kind of run one step behind all the activities and pick up the Doritos out of the carpet and put away the tables and just free up the leaders so that the leaders can be with, with, with uh the students. And I would invite any of you, come talk to me. I'd love to get you on that list. Actually, there are some holes on that team. So I was a part of that a few weeks ago. That was, it, was my, uh, it was my opportunity to do that. Now, listen, I, I did student ministry for eight years professionally. I, I've, I've seen it done in lots of contexts. By the time the night was over, I, I, was, I was lit up. It was, it, it, I don't mean wasted. I mean, <laughs> I was so excited at what I had saw. And yet I couldn't quite put words to it. And I was trying to put words to it, and I, it took a conversation with Teresa and then with the staff the next morning, and finally it hit me. I, I've seen student ministry a lot before. And there, there are times where the leaders that do student ministry, quite frankly, are there because they're looking for friends. And there's not necessarily anything wrong with that, but sometimes what happens in a student ministry is it becomes known like, hey, if you want to get to know some 20-something people, or, or even if you're not 20-something, if you want to meet some friends, come volunteer in the youth ministry because those are where kind of some young, energetic, active people volunteer. Not the case. What stood out to me with what we've got going on on Wednesday nights was the leaders genuinely like the students. I, I, I challenge you, go volunteer there. You will see it in action. They're not there to talk to one another. Like, they are leaning into the conversations with the kids. Example number one, uh, last Sunday at 2 o'clock... Nathan and Scott and Troy, three of the guy leaders, that they took eight middle school kids paintballing for the afternoon. <clears throat> From, from 2 to 5 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon. Listen, you, you don't spend your Sunday afternoon with middle school students unless you like them. I was talking to Nathan before the service started, and he was saying that Jill, who's also volunteering down there, that she did this dinner last night for some of the 6th grade girls, and she expected there to be a couple, or at least he did. And there were eight girls there. And I just quickly volunteered my opinion. I said, I, I think it speaks to the fact that those kids feel liked. And he's like, yeah, but parents had to drive them across town on a cold winter night. I said, yeah, and I think that might speak to how desperate parents are for some help. My point is simply this. God says he likes you, and he's for you, 
And that can be hard to get our brains around in our culture. It's hard to, excuse me, that, that can be easy to take for granted, but, but put yourself in that 1500 BC mindset. Listen, what if fundamentally part of what's going on here is we have a few different ways that we can approach God. Go ahead to that. Will you go to that, that next slide? Yeah. The, the, there's three ways we can approach God. Number one is we can approach God based upon what we've done. And this is very prevalent uh, across cultures. It sounds something like this. Uh, go ahead, next slide. God, I'm a good person. I go to church or temple or whatever. I scatter. I serve people. I treat people well. I even donate money. So would you. It's a bartering system. It, 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 it's, it's a scale system. And that's one very prevalent historic way that people have related to the gods. There's another option. It's, it, it's based upon what's been done to us. And that, that one sounds something like this. Go to that next slide. God, it's really hard right now. I'm going through hell. How could you let that happen to me? It's not fair. So would you? And I think we're all prone to playing this card. It's the victim card. It's the card that says, because it's so bad, God, you owe me something. What if what God is inviting Moses and the people and you and I some 3,500 years later into is a completely different approach, one that's based not upon what's happened to us or what we've done, but based upon who God is? It's based upon who God is on his compassion and his graciousness. That one sounds a little different. It sounds something like this, God, you're compassionate. You like me and you care about me. And you're gracious. You want to help me. And God, you don't owe me a thing, and there's a ton of people who have it way, way worse than me, but based upon your character, your compassion and grace, I ask you for. Can you see how 3,500 years ago, that would have been a radically different approach? What if this God likes us? What if he's for us? I want to get you one other little item to make one other point. We're almost done. Sometimes you have ideas, and then you have to go live them out on Saturday, and, and you're like, what in the world was I thinking? <laughs> that was yesterday. So um, pretend like you're at a wedding, because what I want you to do is grab like a few grapes. They're all cut up meticulously by my flu-covered fingers. So there should be little clusters. Stupidest idea ever, but hopefully helpful. <laughs> Ready? The Eagles? Seriously? Wow. You're going to kill us today. So Kim, will you go to that slide? I, I've, I've actually had the privilege of being in uh, the, the Negev wilderness, which is basically the same thing separated by the Nile River a couple times. The first time was the hottest I've ever been in my entire life. It was 105, 110 degrees. I mean, at some point it's like 150. It's all the same, right? Drier than dry. You can see you're, you're constantly surrounded by stone and rock, so it's like living in an oven and the first year when we went, uh, the, the, the leader was pretty hardcore, and we would, we would leave the bus, and we'd go on these three or four-hour hikes and kind of do these lessons along the way. And I was going to bring one, I forgot it, but they gave us these fanny packs when we signed up for the trip, and everybody kind of laughed at them, but they were our lifeblood when we were there because they had a spot for two 20-ounce water bottles on the side, and then there was a spot on the back where you could strap another, you know, those longer plastic water bottles, like a one-and-a-half or two-liter water bottle to the bottom, and they told us when we, when, we would, when we got there in the bus in the desert, they said, okay, so, so fill those things up and strap an extra one to the bottom of your pack. And you're going like, this is a lot of water. And when you'd been gone for two or three hours, uh, it was so stinking hot. When you got back to the bus, you didn't have a drop of water on you anymore. I mean, you, you're just constantly drinking this water. It is so hot. And you didn't have a catheter. You might not have even gone to the bathroom. I mean, it was just that hot. It just sucked you, sucked it out of you. Well, towards the end of that day, we went as far south as we made it to, and it was to this very spot, which, to be honest with you, was a little bit tacky, and I had mixed emotions about it, but it's obviously the reconstruction of the, the, the Jewish tabernacle. So now think 105 degrees in a wall tent. I mean, it was lovely. 
They're kind of walking you through uh, this historic tabernacle, and we did all that. And by the end of the day, it was like backpacking, where the only thing you'd done is drink water and, you know, eat almonds and kind of trail food all day long, and you're hotter than you've ever been, and you're so fried. And we walked out of here, and before we got to the bus, our leader had had arranged, he had had a, a bunch of grapes. There were about 55 of us on the trip, and we all got like three or four grapes, kind of like what you just got. And it was the most amazing thing I'd ever eaten in my life. Something with flavor, it was cold, kind of a grape snob, so they weren't squishy and nasty. Like, they were hard, good grapes. And there was a sense of like, whoa. My point is simply this. Tacky as it is, if if this is the only message I think that you ever remember from me, I'd be okay with that that the refreshing nature of that, that's what this Bible is dealing with. That this God fundamentally relates to us differently than any other idea that has ever been propagated. 1,500 years later, Paul, and I don't have a slide here, Kim, so don't let me throw you. Paul Paul would say it this when writing a letter to these people in Galatia. If I could find it. He, He says this, I've been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And then watch what he said. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 1,500 years later, Paul's going, here's what you have to understand about this God. Like He likes you so much that he saw that death and sin is a threat to your existence, so he stepped in front of it. Not because he had to, but because he wanted to. Go all the way back to the first commandment where God says, have no other gods before me. This is not a God who is insecure. This is a God who's going, here's the problem. Any other concept you have of God is completely different than me. I'm unlike anybody else you've ever heard about. What happens to our view of obedience, to to our view of life, to our, our view of followership, when we fundamentally start from the place like, wait, wait, wait a minute, this God likes us and he's for us. Let me pray. Lord, <clears throat> thanks God that you, uh, you stoop to our level. And I, I just like to think got sick of being misunderstood and maligned and got sick of people with the best of intentions relating to you on a fundamentally incorrect level. Thanks, God, that you went out of your way to communicate to some people 3,500 years ago that to understand who you are starts from the place that that you think of us the way a mom thinks about her baby. That you're for us. That you like us. And God, we know that that doesn't eradicate mystery from our future and it doesn't get rid of frustration and pain and suffering But Lord, would you give us uh, the relational skill with you that we would approach you not out of what's been done to us or what you owe us, but out of this fundamental understanding that you are gracious and compassionate, that you like us and you're for us. God, would you somehow help us strike a balance between knowing you accurately and yet knowing you mysteriously? Thanks for the cross. Thanks for Christ. Thanks for the resurrection. Thanks for the resounding statement that you made. That you are at your core a self-giving God. We love you. Amen. If you would like to engage further with Narrate Church, you can find contact information online. www.narratechurch.org We would love to hear from you.